All right, what's going on, Salt Strong? It's Justin back here with Tony, having a little bit of a tea time today, chatting about how to find bull redfish. So we're pretty much at the start of fall right now here in Florida. And Wyatt and I did a great tea time talking about biology and the physiology of different game fish in the fall months, where they go, what are the triggers that cause them to go from A to B? You know, they're following bait, they're spawning around these heavy moon phases. And one of the key locations that Wyatt and I discussed to find these, let's say bull redfish, which is the topic of this tea time, was at inlets and passes. Like that would be the number one go-to place to find, you know, big reds here in the fall months as they get ready for their spawn. But let's kind of mix it up here. You know, Tony and I, we fish Mosquito Lagoon and Indian River a lot. And it's pretty far from an inlet or a pass. That's just our particular area. But there are a lot of areas, I'm thinking around the Big Bend part of Florida, right, like the Panhandle. Uh, I'm thinking of areas up in North Carolina and Texas where there's big expansive bays as well. And those are also great areas to find bull reds, but it's a lot of water. And I mean, you know, when we're getting out there, we're spending this time of the year, we've got days on the water trying to find these fish because it's kind of a magical time. And when you do stumble upon them, and they're schooled up, I mean, they would eat a pickle on the surface. They get so fired up sometimes, but it's really cool. And we've kind of learned over the years and through a lot of trial and error, some things that we try to keep our ear to the ground on and things that we look for in our pre-planning to better our chances of finding these fish. So Tony and I wanted to hop on a call to talk with you guys, just kind of our stream of consciousness of things we look for and what we try to prepare for in finding these bulls out in open, expansive areas. So Tony, what's up, man? Thanks for uh, thanks for doing this call with me. How's it going, man? Yeah, no problem. Cool. I kind of want you to to take it away, dude, because I've been watching you do this for a good number of years. Like you've been out there, you know, September, October, and you know, I'd say what for the past four or five years plus, finding these bulls through different methods. Sometimes you're bait and waiting. Sometimes you're out there just scouring the flats for miles and miles, and you've kind of picked up on some things that have helped you be more successful and kind of curb that time spent. Um, if you were to like, you know, get ready the night before, what are some things that you do in trying to find key areas that these bulls might be at? So when, when I find them in the fall, you know, there's really two different types of, you know, two main types of places that I'm finding them. It's they're either going to be hanging out on like sandbars or the edges of flats, which you have a nice depth change there. Usually the mullet is schooling and, you know, traveling, up and down those bars and those schools of reds are following them around because when it comes to spawning time, those fish are gorging themselves with food because once they spawn, they become very lethargic and they have low energy and they're not going to eat much. So they're basically feeding, you know, a ton before the spawn. So pre-spawn is the time to really get on them. And like I said, edges of flats in the beginning of the fall, you know, late summer, early fall, that's where I'm going to be looking for them. And then once the spawn starts to occur, they usually start hanging around areas with high current, you know, the inlets, the passes, uh, like you were saying, when you have those big bays, usually around the bridges, because that constricts the water flow. I know up in North Carolina, you know, around some of the big bridges around the pilings, you know, you get that water flow going through there, it constricts it. And those fish love those areas, number one, for feeding. And number two, because they need that current when they do actually, you know, release their eggs into the environment. Because what that current does is it disperses their eggs into the estuary, into the bay. And on an incoming tide, that's usually when that happens around a full moon. Because, you know, you get the most amount of current flow, incoming tide, those eggs go into the estuary, as opposed to an outgoing tide where they would just go out to the ocean and get eaten by everything that's out there. So depending on the time of year, you know, as far as fall goes, depending on, you know, whether it's early fall, late fall, almost into winter time, that'll sort of determine what areas specifically I want to look for those fish. But one big thing you have to do is really consider, you know, networking uh, with people, you know, looking on uh, whatever websites you have access to forums, we have the private insider community and just taking a look at fishing reports, you know, are people starting to catch bigger redfish? then for me, that's, that's my cue to go, you know, all right, looks like that they're catching those fish around the shallow sandbar. So probably need to go check out areas like that. 
Or if I see people catching them around bridges, it may be time to start looking around bridges and the inlets and the passes and things like that. Yeah, I mean, you're, you kind of hit it right there talking about it, having a network and having a community of people to, to talk with. We've got our insider community and, and we're seeing people post pictures up of Big Reds. Um, people out there using Facebook and Instagram and other means of social media platforms, you'll see the pictures, but might not always have the means to communicate with those individuals that are putting the pick up to, to gather helpful information. Maybe not exactly where they're at, but things and, and that, that platform to communicate on can be a little challenging. We're fortunate to have this insider community where someone could post their, their redfish. We can private message the individual. We can have an open conversation in the chat section and everyone's pretty candid about it. Um, I mean, for our insiders, we have sometimes, depending on the area, we have the ability to be able to kind of drop a pin of the general area that these fish are caught. And like, that's a huge resource for us because we're all kind of helping each other out to be more successful. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a big thing. Like a lot of times that we put in the time and we stumble upon fish and we keep log of our success. And, you know, we've got this platform. We can go back and look at historical trends of this time of the year, three years ago, these were the conditions. This was the wind direction. It was cloudy out, um, you know, and, and I found it in this general area, the, you know, that those patterns and trends, we use that data as a resource to better plan what we're going to do when we're on the water. Um, I mean, for me, for one thing, uh, you know, out, I've always noticed that I'd say from about, let's say 2012. Okay. That's, that's nine years ago. Uh, a lot of times when I would find schooling big bulls out on the open flats, it was actually during the middle of a storm or when it was really rough out, not ideal conditions to be out on the kayak, but I would find these schools humped up around these sandbars and edges and it would always coincide with a really strong north or northeast wind cloud cover like the storm was getting ready to kick off and i never really understood why but that was one example that i know year after year when i go out and i want to search for bulls this heavy weather pattern change tends to get these fish humped up and moving around naturally these fish are going to respond to moon phases they're going to respond they're going to be more aggressive and, and spawning around the full moon which we just had here this past week but they're going to do this again coming into the new moon and the full moon later on in September and early in October. So there's still plenty of opportunities to get on these fish. Um, but aside from moon phases and tides, you know, you mentioned that incoming tide, you know, them trying to spawn so that it coincides with bringing their eggs into the estuary. At the same time, I think wind is a big factor. I think storms in general are a big factor. Um, here on the East Coast, we've talked about the mullet run until we're blue in the face, but a big thing that I think triggers the mullet run and triggers all fish moving around are these change in conditions. And, you know, we've had pretty sunny, calm days. We've been very fortunate lately, but we're starting to get a couple more storms and a couple more Northeast winds and it's getting rough out. And I'm hearing with my ear to the ground and, and with our community, you know, there's more and more mullet popping up and the inlets are starting to go off. So that's kind of another cue for me to be able to say, Maybe you need to go back and check some historical areas, some bars, some flats that are really close to adjacent, deeper channels. Um, you said something really true, Tony. I never really thought about it. But after these fish spawn, there is going to be that period of time where they're going to chill out for a little bit. They're eventually going to go back and feed after they're spawn because they're, they're probably starving. But immediately afterwards, they, can, they probably can be pretty tough to find. So that deep water access is going to be huge. We know, you know, when we go out, if we can't find the fish, we immediately assume that these fish are probably in the intercoastal channel. They're probably in the channel right now and really hard to find in five, six, seven feet of water. And they could be virtually anywhere, but, but they're there for a reason. And I would imagine right now, if we're having a hard time finding them, they're probably in those deeper water access points adjacent to a shallow flat where they have the opportunity to food for food, but feel much safer in that deeper water. You would agree, right? Yeah. And uh, like I said before, you know, they're following the bait because mullet, especially mullet is on the move in the fall. So if you have a large pot of mullet and those fish are feeding heavily on that mullet, the next day that those mullet move to a different, either a different flat or a different bar or whatever, those fish are going to follow suit. So you may not find those fish in the same spot the next week you go out. And, um, you know, there's this one area that we frequent a lot and I always find these redfish on that flat, you know, August, September. And then it seems like they start 
migrating either north or south towards the inlet or south towards you know like Holliver Canal things like that and you, you can just tell when those fish are on the move and sometimes they will be there for a few days if the mullet hangs out you know they will be there but another thing you mentioned were storms if a big storm comes through that'll move those fish out as well because it will move the bait as well so if, you know finding the bait is the biggest thing and uh, something else I wanted to mention about finding these fish when you are looking for these fish on the flats it's pretty easy to do you know they're not small they're usually grouped up in big bunches you'll either see them tailing you'll see them pushing wakes another thing is a look for the birds you see bird circling that's an indicator of mullet and if you see the mullet that's where the fish are usually going to be and if you're fishing deeper you know once you dial in where these fish sort of hang out they usually frequent those spots from year to year you know, they, they go back to the same areas and having side scan, that's going to be huge. Uh, you know, when you do have side scan, you can cover more water. That's why people kind of laugh at us when we have, you know, $700 units on our kayaks, but it helps us find those fish in those deeper areas around bridges. If we're fishing the inlets, the passes, whatever the case may be. Yeah. I mean, that's, the, that's like the brass tax of it is, we're trying to use all resources accessible to us to maximize our efforts in finding them. Finding them is key. In a perfect world, they would fin, they would tail, they would bust bait, whether it's in shallow water or deep water. These fish are always on the move. They are definitely following the bait. Sometimes the schools of mullet are on the shallow flats and two feet of water. And sometimes the schools are out in seven to 10 feet of water. And then it gets really tough because Obviously, it's much deeper water. They don't show themselves as easily. So any resources that you can have to maximize your efforts, you know, having the community of people to chat with, this network is, I mean, that's invaluable. Um, obviously, electronics is a big key. Tony, I mean, I'm using your, your fish finder right now, and it's fantastic. Like, I can mark things 120 feet or more to my left and right. That makes a big difference than just going straight over top of them in seven feet of water. Um but I kind of want to I kind of want to go back to the bait thing real quick, because, yes, the weather and all these conditions and factors are moving the bait around. And for those of you out there that that might not have a boat or a kayak or, you know, at, waiting access to these expansive flats adjacent to deeper water that we're talking about, you know, finding bait and following the bait is is big. So we mentioned on this previous tea time that Wyatt and I did you know, that all these big redfish, the snook, the tarp, and anything that's happening here during the fall months in the mullet run, they're going to be following the mullet in particular. Um, I think of an example like uh, up in North Carolina. So you guys up there that fish the Noose River, Orient City, and you've got these big schools of Menhaden or, or pogies as we call them down here. And you get monster 40 to 50 inch redfish crashing through the bait pods. Sometimes the bait pods are there and there's no action going on at all. Um, so just because you find bait doesn't always mean there's going to be predators on them. There's probably going to be two or three or five pods of bait. And it's a matter of trying to find out which pot of bait has the fish on them. A lot of times this time of the year, and again, we're having these storms and these winds and they're kind of, it's, it's providing, I think the bait an opportunity to be on the move and have a better chance to evade these predators because that's one more element the predators have to kind of work through to get up on this bait. And, um, I think I think the thing is, if you are land based or and and you you know we talk about inlets and passes, obviously that's a great location. Finding those areas where the bait is concentrated is going to be the first thing to consider. But also keep in mind that you could be sitting in a spot that has a lot of bait and there's no action going on. So we are very action based. We try to maximize our efforts. If you only have six or eight hours, which seems like a long time, but if you're kind of in the heat of it, it goes by fast. If you only have a couple hours to get out there and fish from a land-based location and you find bait, give it a little bit of time. Give it 30 minutes, give it an hour. But if the bait's staying still and nothing is crashing it or busting it, and it doesn't seem like there's this light switch that turns on, look for another pot of bait because very well, those predators could be on a different school of bait. Not all pods of bait are always going to have predators on them because there's an inundation of bait. There's way more bait than there are predators right now. So I think systematically tackling those pods is, is something to consider. And whether, you're, whether you have the means to cover a lot of water and find them or you're even landlocked, hop around. There's going to be more places and points and eddies and coves where bait's going to congregate. And 
I mean, Sebastian Inland is a perfect example. I think of, I'm seeing mullet, 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 mullet everywhere, but there's only certain locations that the predators are actually blowing up and attacking the mullet. And it's visually obvious that that is where the fish are. Um, I mean, that's one indicator that you don't have to worry about being limited to where you are and, and your reach of being able to fish. If you see the busting happen, like that, that's, that's, you know, your obvious cue. <laughs> Just keep your eyes peeled for it is, is kind of what I'm saying. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was going to say too, you know, there are going to be way more bait fish than predators out there. And it's usually the structure that those bait fish are around. You know, if you have bait fish just on an open sandy flat that doesn't have any depth changes or potholes or grass, probably won't be many predators around there because they don't have any ambush points. You know, if you're fishing the inlet, if you got rocks on the bottom, there may be a pile of rocks in one spot and not in another. And it's where that pile of rocks on the bottom is that those fish are busting the bait because they have that amber spot. I agree, man. So, you know, I wanted to kind of take a closer look at wind direction. So for those guys fishing in bays, for example, I think of, uh, there's an expansive bay around Navarre. I fished the panhandle a couple of years ago in September. And obviously there's bulls at three mile bridge, like bridges are a great location to find bulls, but the wind direction, I've always thought this was interesting. I had heard I don't know if this is a myth or if there is some truth to it, but fish move in the direction of where the wind is being blown. So we, we preach a lot about finding structure, finding wind protected shorelines. When you're a bull redfish, I don't think you really care about that wind. You probably use it to your advantage. And, you know, for us in Mosquito Lagoon, Indian River, we don't really have tides. The How high or how low the water is, is going to be really wind driven. And I think that even in areas that have some tidal flow, these big expansive bays, there's not a lot of water rushing in and out. Wind plays a huge factor in that. And I've always wondered, and I think we're still trying to piece this together, if the direction of the wind ends up, how do I say this? When we have a north wind, I've tended to find a lot of my fish on the northern area of wherever I'm going as if they were pushing into the wind as opposed to following it. Now, bait will, you know, that, that changes, I'm sure at times, but in my scouting, and I look at conditions the day before and I say, okay, I have a strong south wind. Either these fish are going to be up at the other end where the wind is blowing all the bait to potentially, or fish are going to move down into the wind. I've had times out on the flats, Tony, where I'm looking at redfish and I'm trying to take a close, I'm trying to analyze the direction that they're facing. And more often than not, these fish end up facing into the wind. And I've always wondered if that's because they were waiting in anticipation of bait fish or if they're programmed to slowly migrate into the wind. And kind of what I'm saying is, you know, when you're planning and when you're trying to find these fish, uh, we're going to have north winds most of the time this time of the year. And I think a lot of these fish end up pushing into the wind to probably find bait um, and head their way into inlets and passes. So if you're going to be out on the open flats, and you have a north wind, for example, I tend to fish areas where, uh, where I, I can fish about as far north as I possibly can in that given area. Um, as opposed to a south wind, if I have wind shifting directions and that big change happens, I've found that there's times where redfish are, if I have a south wind, much, much further south than I would normally fish for them. So that wind direction and intensity, I think, obviously gets fish to move around. But I think there's this correlation of the direction that that these fish respond to i hope that makes sense um have you ever noticed something like that before where you're looking at the or orientation of these fish you know depending on the wind direction somewhat you know it's hard to say why they're doing it you know it could be like you said because it's easier for them to just see what's coming at them with that wind just like they would do in the current but i don't know that that's a tough one to call yeah. I mean, there's still, there's still a lot of unknowns in this. It's kind of why like not everybody is catching bulls, but at the same time, you can start piecing together all these little things to increase your, your chances of being successful. Um, so, I mean, we're talking about bait is obviously a, a huge factor, uh, moon and wind direction and wind intensity, any kind of change in the environment is going to be a big factor. Um, and as Wyatt and I talked about on a previous podcast, understanding the physiology of these animals of when those key times of the spawn occur, when they're going to feed, when they're going to have that period of relaxation, and when they're going to start bulking up again for that next spawn is going to help you determine what kinds of areas these fish are going to be found. 
Uh, we mentioned one of them, Tony, and it kind of being a sandbar edge uh, in, in areas where there isn't really a lot of structure. A lot of the areas that we fish can be open, expansive sand flats, and it's frustrating. But these, a lot of times these bulls are not just going to be out in the open flats, especially if there's no bait. They're going to be oriented to something, the, the smallest amount of things. And, uh, you know, a lot of areas we fish feel like a desert. And I'm sure that's going to apply to a lot of people as well. You can have open, expansive mud flats or just everything that looks cookie cutter, if you will, and finding those little differences. For us, it's, it's sandbar edges that are adjacent to a little bit of a depth change. The depth change could only be one or two feet, or it could be five to 10 feet. I mean, it varies. But in doing your planning and looking online, um, Luke has a lot of classes. If you guys haven't taken a chance to look, uh, how to dissect Google Maps, Google Earth, Tony, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other platforms to, that people can use to get some both kind of real-time data of what they're looking at in their pre-plan, as well as looking at some historical data online to get an idea of where were places that had defined sandbars, where are places that had seagrass close to deep edges. You know, doing that planning ahead of time helps, you know, narrow down the areas of, of where you want to spend your time to find these bulls. Yeah, for sure. And um, let's see, a couple other things I wanted to mention too, sort of wrap this up, you know, all these fish aren't going to be behaving at the same exact time, uh, the same way. What I mean by that is, you know, for example, here we have three different bodies of water that are pretty much connected to each other. We have Mosquito Lagoon, Banana River, Indian River. And it seems like in one body of water, the fish seem to start schooling up a little earlier than another body of water. So you know, if you miss that opportunity in one body of water, I'll go to the other one and try to find them in the same spot that I was looking for them or same type of spot I was looking for them in another body of water. And same thing, you know, regionally, these fish are going to start spawning earlier, you know, the further north you go because the temperature is dropping faster up there than as you get down south. So that's another thing to keep in mind when you are looking for these fish. And when you are targeting these fish, something very important, you know, they are spawning, they are the breeder fish, they are what replenishes the fish in our area. Make sure you're handling these fish with care, you know, support the belly, uh, the belly, if anything, don't take them out of the water, just unhook them in the water. If you want to lift them up for a quick pick, again, support the belly, don't hang them from the jaw, and don't fight them on super light tackle, because these fish are going to get super tired and they're going to get tired as it is with the whole spawning season going on. So make sure you have the right gear, you know, heavier gear, at least 20 pound line, 30 pound leader, just so you can get these fish in quick. The quicker you can get them in, snap a pick, the healthier that fish is going to be on the release. Yeah, like PSA for everybody in the back. Like that is, if we want to, you know, end this whole thing, we're, we're all excited to target the bigger variety of all these different species, but redfish is the hot topic right now. I and mean, that's the whole focus of this call. And it's something we're all excited about and passionate about. But along with that, it's important to stress, you, you need to take care of this fishery. You know, if, if you have the opportunity or, or the, the fortunate chance of catching a big bull, keep it in the water as long as possible. Make sure your hands are wet, support that belly like Tony's preaching. I mean, anything you can do to help with the survival of these species so that your you know, future generation can go and enjoy it as well is huge. So, I mean, yeah, if we're going to end it on anything, guys, like as much fun as it is, be smart about how you're handling these guys. Go out with the right gear. hundred percent, Tony. Thank you for saying that. For sure. Yeah. So guys, like this is, uh, you know, we're, we're having more tea times and talks like this in between all the times that we have a chance to go out and get on the water and uh, develop some proof of, of concept for you guys so we can show you we're getting out and doing the same things we're preaching. We're talking to one another. We're talking to everybody in our insider community right now to gather all this information to increase our chances of being more successful. Sharing these helpful tips with you guys is what we're all about over at saltstrong.com. We're here to help you be a better angler. And we do that by giving you tools and resources, but helping you understand what these trends and these patterns are. Physiology, bait, bait source and availability, 
um, structure, wind protection, tides. We systematically go through all this information and in your backyard too. I mean, we do spot dissections, Tony, all the time of, of areas in Virginia and Texas and Louisiana of showing places of what we would look for in our pre-planning to be successful so that you can do the same. So you can go actually go out there and apply those techniques in your area and catch more fish. So it's a really cool place, guys. You guys got to go over to saltstrong.com. Check us out. Join our insider community. Reach out to Tony and I. And uh, hopefully we get to see you guys on the water soon. Um, thank you, man, for being on this call with me. Sure. And uh, hopefully we can get out on the flats and find some bulls together. Yeah, I'll be out there Saturday. So, All right, dude. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you, guys. We'll see you later. Take it easy. And if you're new to Salt Strong, just know that we're the best online fishing club in America because we literally guarantee that you'll start catching more fish in less time. And we do this by providing you with premium education, an exclusive online fishing community, and huge discounts on the best tackle for saltwater anglers. So to learn more, go to saltstrong.com, and we'll see you in the Insider Family soon.